item is our educational item, and Larry, I think you're going to introduce that for us, right? Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you for having us here this morning. At the, uh, at the May 2018 meeting, the, the board reviewed the results of the actuarial valuations as of June 30th, 2017. That included for the defined benefit program, for the defined supplemental program, for the cash balance benefit program, and also for the supplemental benefit maintenance uh, account and they adopted resolutions setting contribution and earning rates. In in that same month, uh, CalSTRS released and issued a, a, a press release stating that the systems funded ratio, which is the ratio of smooth actuarial assets to pension obligations, is 62.6%. And this actuarial valuation information is also uh, included and reported in CalSTRS financial reports. Yet the CAFR shows for the state teachers retirement program a funded ratio of 69%. Well, which is correct? In short, they're both correct. And our goal today is to provide an overview of funding the state teachers retirement program based on actuarial standards and how that information is reported in the financial statements consistent with governmental accounting standards. We do have a triple A presentation today, meaning it's by actuaries, accountants, and auditors. <laughs> 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 and we and we like this stuff so um, today we have Dave Lamoureux our CalSTRS actuary also Lucy Arbuckle our director of accounting operations and Brenda Torres and Kevin Smith who are partners with Crow who is CalSTRS external financial statement auditor so I'll turn the time now over to David Lamoureux for our presentation good morning everyone uh, I was a little uh scared when I first arrived this morning and I saw my name was right in the middle, surrounded by accountants and auditors. I <laughs> promise I will be kind to all of them in my presentation. Uh, no, so the goal of today, as, as Larry said, uh, it can be quite confusing when you look at our CAFRA, you look at the valuation reports we, we present to you every year. The information is different. The terminology is different. So today, I will just the goal today is just to help you understand if you look at one or the other, uh, why is the information different and why you may see information floating out there in the public that maybe you thought was different than what we presented to you. Because I can tell you, especially when you see a lot of stories out there, uh, especially like national studies that like to compare retirement systems, I think most people have a tendency to look at our financial statements. So I think the 69% funded that Larry quoted, I think is what gets most often picked up in media, especially in nationwide studies, because that's where people get it. But you know, for us, when we come to you, because we put so much emphasis emphasis on the defined benefit program, we keep telling you, you know, we're about 63% funded. So they're both correct, and we'll show you why as we go through this. So, uh, so the main reason why some of that information is different is you have to start as to who sets the, who sets the rules. And when it comes to funding, you have that authority as the board. As board members, you decide on the methods we use to value those numbers, the assumptions, so you set the rules. But when it comes to what we put in our financial statements, it's the Government Accounting Standard Board, what we call, what we like to refer to as GASP that sets the rules. And it's interesting because if you look at the history, so there has been over time three statements that GASP has issued to provide guidance to retirement plans as to what to report in their financial statements. It all started with GASB 5. Then in the mid-90s, GASB 25, 27 came on board. And then a couple years ago, in 2014 for us, GASB 67, 68 became effective. And what's interesting about these is how it has changed over time. When GASB 5 was in effect, if you try to locate some funding information into your financial statements, it was always different. You wouldn't be able to reconcile the two. Then when GASB issued statement 25 and 27, now it changed. It provided more flexibility to the plans when reporting in their financial statements. And now you could once again see the funding information was generally the same in financial statements. 
Now, GASB 6768 came effective for us in 2014, and now we're back in a world where funding does not equal accounting. So just, just because the, the rules are different, but it's interesting to see historically how it has changed. So the three things, again, I want you to remember today is why they're different is, first, you have terminology. If you, tr if you look in our valuation reports and you look in the financial statements, if you're looking for a number that maybe should be the same, you'll find different terminology. Uh, and here, so if we start with the asset information, you can kind of see, if you look in the financial statements and you're looking for you know, how much assets we actually have in the fund, Gatsby calls this the fiduciary net position, or like what we, you know, what we would refer to as the market value of assets. But when we come to you for funding valuation purposes, uh, we call it the actual value of assets. And it's also what we call the smoothed value of assets. Just in case you, you may not be familiar, but we have a board policy that says that for funding purposes, in order to keep contribution changes smoother and to also our changes in funded status a little bit smoother, we uh, smooth the impact of investment uh, fluctuations over time, over a three-year period, which is why uh, the actual value of asset is never equal to the fiduciary net position. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. And the other thing to remember, I remember back in May, Harry comes to me, uh, we, we, we saw each other in, in the cafeteria, and he said, uh, Chris just told us that we have $224 billion in our fund, but I'm looking at the DB valuation report, and it says we have $180 billion. Why are they so different? Generally, when Chris reports and what we put in our financial statements, it's the aggregation of all of our programs. When we come to you, we tend to put a lot of emphasis on the defined benefit program, but we also have other programs. And when you, so we come to you separately. So that's the thing to remember. CAFRA is aggregated. We come to you one valuation report per program that we administer. DBS, cash balance, SBMA. But for GASB, for financial reporting purposes, we aggregate them into one number, and we call it the, the, the teachers, basically our teacher's retirement fund. So that's basically the one thing to remember. So again, I'm going to go back to last June because that's what we have published right now. We said the fiduciary net position or the market value of asset was $210 billion. And you can see how it's broken into the various programs. And now if I were to ask you, okay, take the valuation reports that we gave you last June and add those up, would they agree? So again, 210 billion, that's the market value, the fiduciary net position. Now, if you take the actual value of assets from all the reports we showed you last May, you would come up to $206 billion, a little bit less. And now, if I did that every year in the past, there would be a year where the amount would be higher. Okay? So just think about it. Uh, the board policy says if we to take investment either gains or losses, so in excess of what we assume. So we assume 7%. If we earn 10%, the policy says don't recognize the full 3% gain, only recognize 1% in the first year, 1% the next year, 1% the following one. So if you remember in 16, 17, we had a very good investment year. So what we've done is we've banked aside some of those investment gains. So for funding purposes, we've recognized we have not yet recognized all the investment gains we've had the last few years, which is why the value is a little bit less. Now, if you go back in some of the years where we had returns below what we expected, you'll find the opposite. The actual value of asset was higher than what was reported in our CAFR. So that's the other thing to keep in mind is they'll never agree, uh, first because they're aggregated, but most importantly because we smooth, from a funding perspective, we smooth those gains and losses over time. So basically, so you can see now already why the funded status is a little bit higher in the CAFRA, because already we're starting with $4 billion more in assets. So that's the number one reason now why it's 69%. So it's a little bit higher. So you, we've got more assets, so keep that in mind. So assets are higher. Now let's switch on the other side. That's my side of the business, the, the liabilities. I always like to say that I'm a liability to the system. Uh, <laughs> So again, different terminology. GASB calls it total pension liability. In your valuation reports, we call it actual obligation. Sometimes you hear actual liability, but basically total pension liability. And here again, combined in the CAFRA, you see it separately. 
Now, this is where we start to have more differences. So if you think about what goes into the liability calculation, uh, you have something called the actual cost method that uh, we proposed a method to you. It's called the, I will not go into what exactly it means, but it's called the entry age normal cost method. This is the method you have approved that we will use as a system. It's pretty much the method that's used by most, if not all, public retirement systems in the US. And the good thing is when GASB came on board, it said you should use the entry age normal cost method to do calculations. So that's a good thing. That's, that's generally the same there. Uh, actual assumptions, so basically how long people live, when do they retire, the assumed return, like our 7% assumed return, this is where we start to have differences. And also, you probably wouldn't think we would have differences when it comes to participant data, but when you co try to compare our 2017 numbers in the CAFRA versus the actual valuation, the participant data is also different. And that's the one that generally surprises a lot of people, like why would the data be different? So let's start with the data. Here's why. Prior to GASB 67, GASB allowed retirement system to report pension plan information that was, you could say, a year old. So in the past, under GASB 25, in our 17 CAFRA, it would have been okay to report the 2016 numbers. When GASB 67 came on board, GASB said, no, you should report a total pension liability as of 2017. But if you remember the, the timing, by the time we do our CAFRA, the actual work has yet to be done. So GASB was aware of this and provided flexibility in their statements by saying it's okay to take a valuation that's a year old and to roll it forward to do a projection a year later and to use that information. So in our CAFRA for 2017, guess what? It's based on 2016 demographic information. And then when we did our funding valuation last year, as of 17, it was based on 2017. Now, our system is so large that it shouldn't be, it, it's not going to be materially different, but if you were trying to reconcile to the dollar, you would never be able to, starting with the demographic data, just different years. Now, the assumptions. The good thing is on the, on the demographic side, Gatsby said you can use the same assumptions that you use funding-wise, but where it started to be different was on the economic assumption side, especially the investment return assumption. So let's talk about the investment return. Now, uh, so on this one, GASB actually came out with a, what they call a blended rate approach. So this is probably gonna be the most technical part of my presentation. I'll try to keep it high level. Uh, GASB basically said, uh, ask the plans to calculate what they call the blended investment return by doing this. They ask the system to project forward into the future their asset balance to see if the assets were ever going to be depleted at some point in the future. So to remember before the funding plan, we kept saying that in 30 years we're going to run out of money. So let's, be, let's assume we're in a world where the funding plan did not pass and we have to do GASB 67. Here's what we would have had to do at the time. We would have had to do a projection of are our assets expected to be depleted. If they are, GASB said, in the years where you have enough assets, you can discount your future cash flows using your expected long-term rate of return, so 7% for us. And then it said, in the years where you no longer have assets, now you have to discount them using a 20-year municipal bond rate. So that's why they call it a blended rate. Now, the good thing for us now that we have the funding plan, we're, we're not expected to deplete our assets. Therefore, we can use the expected long-term investment return. But there are systems out there in the US where they have to use this blended approach. But every year, we have to perform this calculation. We do a 100-year projection to show that, we, that the assets are not expected to be depleted so that we can show to our auditor that it is appropriate for us to use the long-term uh, investment return. Now, the one difference, and I'll be honest, I was never a big fan of this, and uh, was GASB decided to go with what's called a gross of administrative expenses investment return assumption. Yes. 
blended rate. So just to be clear, a, a long-term municipal bond rate would be a lower discount rate, right? Yeah, oh, it's, under it's almost an, all it's, circumstances. It's, right? Yeah, it's right. around it's around four. Right. Yeah, three or four now. Correct. So that would increase that would tend to increase your li the present value of your liabilities. Yes. Right. Correct. So that would be the impact. Yes. Would Correct. Okay. Thank you. So yeah. So had we, it would have been even more confusing in my opinion right. because had we not had the funding plan, we would have had to report in our financial statement a funded status that would be dramatically lower than what we would have reported to you in funding valuation because of the use of a much lower uh, discount rate. There was actually a story in the paper just recently. I think there was some criticism toward, I don't know if it was toward Gatsby, the whole process, but there was a one of the state, I forgot which one it was, maybe it was Minnesota, where they just recently passed a funding plan arrangement and now they're no longer expected to have to to deplete their assets. So all of a sudden, in their financial statements, their funded status dramatically improved. So I think the 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 person who wrote the article had a, had criticism, saying like, how can you, you know, have all of a sudden a much higher funded status simply because you made a promise to put more money in the fund in the future? But that's sort of a yeah. yeah. So but. So for us here, the, the the one thing I want you to remember here to pay attention here is the gross of admin expenses. So, I've, yeah, I've got a couple of qu people who have some questions. Okay. I think we might still be on the blended rate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, thank you. This is a really interesting presentation, and I'm just curious, um, sort of around what you're talking about with one of those states. So are these, as these systems are being required to use a blended rate, and obviously I'm sure there's a lot of media coverage, the fact that they're going to run out of money. <coughs> Is it spurring them to pass funding plans, or are they doing a fairly good job of trying to educate people about what this means, or what has been the repercussions of that? That's a very good question. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'll let Jack jump in. <laughs> you know what I would say is just relative to us that that was actually the final letter we wrote to the legislature before our funding plan was passed. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually wrote a letter that said failure to pass this bill will result in our reporting the liabilities in this manner, and and this is what will happen from it. So um, I wouldn't say, I, I would never say that's what made the bill pass, but it certainly added context to the um, the, the ill effects that would happen without a funding plan. Yeah. Um, but I think all of our colleagues that, that are in these situations are, are very consumed by this issue, and very concerned about it, how it presents itself to the state legislatures. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Joy? Um, so on the same issue, uh, <clears throat> so is the, um, the determination of whether you have to use the blended rate, is that based on just a, being able to demonstrate that there is a plan to fully fund the plan, or is it based on your um, kind of, you know, is there a, a quantitative metric in terms of your funding status? No, it's simply if you can demonstrate that you will never run out of assets in the future, then you can use your long-term investment return. So you have to do. You have to actually do a, a long term projection of your assets. Okay. We'll get to kind of the auditor's requirements as well. But based upon these two questions, I'd say this is anecdotally the GASB sixty seven and sixty eight. GASB would have told you that they weren't in the business of establishing policies for pension plans, but it drove a lot of conversation and a lot of action by boards. And across the country, we saw a lot of people institute. Um, funding plans that hadn't existed before. This put a lot of pressure on the auditing profession as well because as, as David just said, if we can demonstrate a plan, then we stay out of this you know, crossover point, which dramatically reduces or potentially would increase the liability significantly. The AICPA, which is the, who establishes the standards that we follow as auditors, basically gave us a one-time pass as auditors. To really listen, you know, if, if the state can show that they've instituted this, then we need to believe them one time. But with that said, if we looked back through history, there have been a lot of states who have passed rosy funding pictures, and then every time, you know, in five years, we're going to increase our funding. And when five years pass, they, they change legislation and bring it back down. So there was kind of a one-time pass that everybody will believe, as long as you can kind of ground it in reality, that, that you're going to use this funding. But if they start playing games as to we take that funding away right when it's about to kick in, 
then as auditors, we've got to raise our hand and say, we don't believe that this funding level will actually occur, and therefore you're most likely within the crossover date. So this is a, just an example of, of how GAAP is applied, but where the auditors are going to insert themselves and really try to make sure that it's, that it's a valid and the best estimate at that point in time. Now we can go on to administrative expenses. You're good. <laughs> no more questions. No, so on this one, basically, uh, this is the one item that, because GASB asks all retirement system to calculate the liabilities using a return that is gross of administrative expenses, for us, the numbers are never going to match because when we do funding valuations, we do reflect uh, administrative expenses in the 7%. So that 7% assumption that you adopted in 2017 actually has in it the assumption that administrative expenses will be about 10 basis point, 0.1%. So for accounting purposes, guess what? We use 7.1% for all of the programs. While we use seven for most on funding per, for, on a funding base, except cash balance, for which we use six and a half percent. So you can see right there, uh, and again, if you, if you go back to the comment that Paul made, higher discount rate, higher investment returns means lower liabilities. So now I've shown you before that our assets are higher for accounting purposes than they are for funding. Now, because of the 7.1% versus seven or six and a half, the liabilities are also going to be lower. On, a, on an accounting basis. So, so that's also another reason why the funded status is always going to be higher when you look at our financial statements, at least for 2017. So again, if you try to add up the liabilities, last year in our CAFRA, we reported 300, about $303 billion was the total pension liability. If you take all of our valuation reports from last May, you add them up, what do you get? About 309. So now you've got about, just over $6 billion more in liabilities before I told you about $4 billion more in assets. So you can see we're close to a $10 billion difference in what we report overall. So unfunded liability. Uh, if you try to look in our CAFRA, you will not find a term called unfunded liability. You have to look for something called net pension liability. This is equivalent to what we call the unfunded actual obligation or unfunded actual liability. And again, combined in the CAFRA, for, and it's separated for the programs we present to you. And you've tried, if you're curious to see how it differs. So if you open the CAFRA, you're going to find out that our net pension liability or the unfunded liability is $92.5 billion. Do you remember when I presented to you in May, I told you for the first time ever for the defined benefit program, we have an unfunded liability exceeding $100 billion? So it was 107.3 billion is what we reported as of 2017. But the DBS program is a surplus. The cash balance program is a surplus. And as you know, we're going to have a more discussion in September about SBMA. We have excess resources in that program as well. But the, the other part too that's tricky is SBMA is not funded. Remember, if you go back a couple of slides, I said the actual cost method is generally the same. It's the same for all programs, except when you look at SBMA. We have a different way of measuring uh, the funded position for the SBMA program. It's actually done on a, on, a, on a projection basis. We project to 2089, is there enough resources to sustain purchasing power through that level? So that number, you see the $9.8 billion of excess resources we presented to you, that actually also includes uh, expected surpluses from the future. So it's not... So on a funding basis, you cannot just add the numbers that we put in the report and, and compare them to the 92.5. So that's another complication there. But again, you can see, if you look in our CAFRA, it's going to look like you know, we are in a better position than what we reported in our DB program. And now funded status, same thing. As Larry said, we are, the CAFRA says we're 69% funded. And you can see here the various programs, the DB, 62.6. DBS and cash balance are both uh, funded, uh, more than 100% funded, which if you remember last May, the board adopted additional earnings credit for both programs because they were both uh, funded at that level. And it's interesting because uh, this creates a lot of confusion. And just yesterday, it was just interesting, the, the timing, we received an inquiry from a reporter. And the first question, I'm confused. 
I was looking in your CAFRA, you're 69% funded, but I'm looking at this press release that you issued last May, where you said you're 62.6% funded. Which one is accurate? And then that person digged into both the valuation report and the CAFRA and said, I'm even more confused. You're saying the CAFRA, you assume 7.1%, and then in the valuation report I looked at, I think uh, the person was looking at 2016, it says you, you assume 7.25%. Is the 7.1 net of admin expenses? So you can see these numbers start to create a lot of confusion out there with people that just rely on the information that's on our website. Because you can find both the valuation report and the CAFRA. So that's what you have to be, you know, they're both correct. But you just have to understand kind of what their intent and who sets the rule and so forth. So with this, I will, yes. Queuing sure. up my question perfectly because that's exactly, so, so my question is more around, we get, I get members all the time asking about this. The, they just want to know what's the, you know, they just, oftentimes they want to hear Chris's number, how much did we make this year? And, and then what's our, our funding stuff, you know, what's the percentage? And, um, and so I'm wondering, can you help us with, I realize this is kind of a accounting auditor, actuarial, you know, this is for that piece, but I wonder for like the teachers in the back of the room or the public or reporters, how do we simplify this so that we can give clear, is, is there a way to do that while still being true and accurate to these standards that we have to hold to? Because it, it seems like we just have these two, right? The accounting and the funding. The numbers are different, but it, it, I can see how the public perception could be that's inconsistent or why are there two different numbers? And obviously we've seen that <coughs> happen across the world, how, how accounting has been used as, a, as a, a weapon, honestly, to attack retirement systems and things like that. So is there, when a teacher asks us our funding status, what's the best way to respond to that? And is there a, a more simple way to provide that information? So being an actuary, I would tell you to look <laughs> to the I right side of that, that slide. I knew it. <laughs> no, I, 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 would tell you, I would tell you to look to the left side. <laughs> I was just going to say, the auditors are going to say one thing. And Bob, what do you... <laughs> I'll go, I'll go next. <laughs> no, I think, uh, to me, I think just, I think if we want to be honest to our members, uh, the major portion of their income that they're going to get from us will come from the defined benefit program. You know, you have to keep in mind that both, you know, uh, as we've shown you, they both are prepared on different bases. Uh, in my opinion, if, you're, if they're worried about security of their benefit, what we're doing to ensure that their benefit will be secure, I think the right measurement for this is what's done in the funding valuation. I think accounting was done for other purposes. I think Kevin can probably add to this after, but you know, the, the funding work we do, it's all to reassure you or to warn you if we believe that there are things happening that we don't like that could impact the funding of the system. Now, with the passage of the funding plan, right. we've had, we've been, you know, in the, in the good place the last few years of being able to tell you we're on path to reach full funding. I was not here five years ago when the message was different. Uh, I just except hope. For, except for we lowered the assumed rate of return, so then that number, which you helped me with, correct. but the number went down. The it last does, years, but so we're still in a better place than right. we were no, a few I'm years a, ago. So I'm a long term. Okay, but, you know, but to me, like every time I tell someone, I think we're going to cover this also in September in that item right. that we call the 80% funding myth. Uh, as actuaries, we don't like to, you know, put a lot of emphasis on the current funding level. Because, you know, uh, you could be 80% funded today. We could be looking at a system that's 80% funded and us at 63. And once you look at them, uh, if the 80% is expected to decline over time, I would tell you we're much better funded than they are because we've got a plan to make progress. So you have to look at what's the path going forward. It's much more important where you are today. So that's the message I would tell people is you got to look where we expect to be in the future, no, not where we are. Because if you even go back before the funding plan was passed, we were better funded than 63%. But we were on a downward trajectory. So it was a, we were in a much worse situation, although just if you look on a funded status basis, we were better. So that's my, that would that's be my, very my message. I, I agree. I guess I just want to say that for all those who, because I think that's how, when we were going through the funding solution, that's, I think, how we talked yeah. about it. Where's the arrow 
headed is the language we were talking about. Yeah. We want to head towards 100%. And we're doing that. Um, yeah. So the numbers really, in, in, no offense to y'all, but it doesn't seem like the numbers, they do matter, but they don't matter as much as the direction that they're heading. If that makes sense. Yes. So. I, I, Did you I, wanna? I'd add to, <clears throat> excuse me, add to that, and I agree with everything that David just said. But if you think about what the purpose of the financial statements are, right. is to point right. out exactly where we are at one point in time. Sure. So that's where there's kind of a significant difference between the smoothing of assets versus what is the fair value as of June 30th. And, and I agree from David's perspective as an actuary or as a board or even as a member, I've got to be focused on the directional of the funding status. But what, we're, what those financial statements are going to report is June 30th, 2018. Didn't happen, but if June 28th, 2018, there had been an event and 10% of the market had gone away and then recovered July 2nd, you would still report that decline as of June 30th. Shouldn't change anybody's perspective as to how they fund over the course of the next year, et cetera. So it is a point in time. This is our best estimate of exactly where we are today without reference to where are we headed in the future. Harry? Uh, uh, just an observation and a comment. I think one of the most impactful slides that I, we use uh, for me is the slide, it's really simple, it's not very noisy. Funding status of CalSTRS prior to the passage mm -hmm. of the legislation, funding <laughs> status of the plan post signing of the legislation. So I think that trajectory is really, really important. And I would agree if we're intellectually honest with ourselves and we look at it over the long term, assuming all of the other variables that are in play, that we assume assume a 7% return net of fees over 30 years. That's an assumption. We might be right. We might be wrong. We'll be better off if it's above 7. We'll be less off if it's below 7. It assumes people are going to die at a certain age. It assumes there's going to be a certain number of people in the uh, employment and, and teaching schools. And what I can assure you is all of those assumptions will not be right. But what we do have control over is a funding plan that's in place that over time puts, sends us in the right direction. And I think that's mm -hmm. when I talk with members, we can keep it simple. You know, we're mindful that there are challenges. There are a lot of issues we have no control over, some of which we do. That legislation was historic. But things are going to change. So we just have to be mindful of what those, as those changes occur, what we have control over and control those things that we can. So I love that one slide. I think mm -hmm. that no, that's I, a good slide I, to I, bring I, back to yep. the members to yep. you know, just reinforce and reassure them. We haven't missed a pension pen, uh, payment in 100 years. We have no intention of missing one in the future. Are there challenges? Yes. We're aware of them. We've got good people managing the system. Well said. I'm well, glad you. you've uh, paid attention and learned yeah. very well from our risk <laughs> report last fall. It was the first 12 years of school, not so much paying attention. <laughs> okay, with this, I will gladly pass it over to Lucy. Bob, did you have any, yeah. anything to say? So, Ms. Hendricks, to answer your question, as your external consultant, right side funding, even though I'm an accountant, mm -hmm. and within there, the DB, end of the story. But... But I would like to add, with respect to the two biggest questions you said you get, which are what were the investment returns this year, what's the number, right, percentage, and the second, what's our funding rate? And you could pluck that off of that part that I said to pluck off, right? But even there, I, I think, in, in my opinion for you, a better answer for any board member to give to a member who comes and says, what were the returns this year, and what is our funding status? I think to draw attention reasonably away from snapshots is important. So the reason we do snapshots is because we want to be accountable, right? The reason we prepare financial statements is accountability to the public, to the system, to those who provide, to the government. And good golly, you have to, you have to take a snapshot if you're going to do an audit. You've got to cut it off at some point, don't you? So it's mechanical almost, right, as accountants, that we take that snapshot. And as actuaries, Dave knows he has to give you a report so that they, the actuaries have to pick a snapshot and they bring you the number and here it is. And it's because we have to. 
But what we really would like to communicate with you, what's really effective to communicate to the, the, the members, is let's not look at a particular snapshot, because they tell us something but only about today. What they don't tell us is where we're headed. Now, with respect to returns, no one's got that crystal ball, or at least I sure don't. I don't think anyone does. But you do the best you can with respect to a uh, well-diversified portfolio according to the standards that the board sets forth in the investment beliefs, and you roll ahead with that, and, and you just have to have belief in the economy. With respect to the funding level, it's far more important to look at what uh, uh, Mr. Keeley said, which is, where do we expect, where have we been? There's nothing wrong with looking back either in time, right? There's a yesterday as well as a tomorrow. Where are we today and where do we expect to be in the future with reasonable assumptions about the new status? So what I would ask is, if I were you, I would ask these guys, where do I go to get that? Right? Where, where can I look inside the CAFR for the left side of the table or inside the actuarial reports for the right side of the table to get information about where do we expect, if the assumptions hold up, okay, given that, where do we expect our funding levels to be over what period of time? Where does that show up? Because that's the information I believe you should be communicating to any board member that comes to you. And if there's one place to go and find it all, then you all know where to go. You all have the same information. You're telling the same consistent and proper story. So that's what I would ask the left and right side of the tables. Where do I go to get that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to add to Mr. Yetman's comment, hopefully you all know that you can find some of this information in the valuation report, but more importantly, in that risk report we present to you every November. And again, this November, when we come to you, we will expand a little bit on some of the information we present to you we present to you in the past and what we're going to do as we do every year once we've officialized what we've earned for the year we will graphically show you uh, next november how uh, it has changed our outlook for the future and just be before we move on i mean i think one of the, the the risk report is really important but one of the challenges that we that we we know we have is that even though we have the funding plan in place that our funded status has gone down and will continue to go down for a while because we have negative amortization. And so, you know, being able to explain what's going on, but to be able to explain that where we will be in the future is much better than where we would have been without the funding plan is really the message. We're going to find that, I think, in the the risk report, but the problem is, is that if you look at just numbers over, you know, the recent, the recent history, either looking at the accounting numbers or the actuarial numbers, despite the fact that we've enacted the, a funding plan, or the legislature has, our, our funded status has been going down. So that's an additional challenge that we have to be able to explain, um, but it's there in the risk report, and that's one of the reasons that it's so great that we're now having this risk report because, because unlike the actuarial reports and the and the and the financial statements, which are sort of saying here's the status as of this date, the the, the risk report is is showing us where where we expect to be in the future. You yeah, know, and it, I think the one comment I'd like to make here, I know we present a lot of we present this to you, but we also spend a lot of time during the year to meet with our various stakeholders to make sure they understand all of this. And now I'll speak on behalf of Grant and Joyce Lynn, but the last few months, Joyce Lynn and her staff have been meeting individually with all of the legislators to try to have them understand our funding plan, to let them know, hey, it, if you see our unfunded liability increase on an annual basis, it's okay. That's how the funding plan was designed. We still expect to reach full funding. So we're, we're doing our best out there to try to make sure that everyone understands uh, the parameters that were kind of put in, in our funding plan and what it means long term. So. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, okay. We've got... <laughs> Sure. It, I guess it just made me think of like Stephen Colbert's term of truthiness, you know, that like right now we live in a world of perception. It's not always based on facts. And I, I love hanging out with you all because it's everything's objective and these are the numbers. And and sometimes the world I live in is the perception. You know, do we trust Cal, you know, is is and then just the political world, the landscape. So I think that's one of the challenges is when numbers are off, it sort of seems like it's a, a place, or when numbers are different, I should say, 
um, it seems like it can be a wedge to say, you know, what's really going on here. And so I think that's the challenge is perception versus reality or facts versus, you know, fiction. So I think that's some of, some of us live, live, I think most of us live in that reality. And so it's just important to present facts. And I appreciate you, you're, you helped me a lot last year with the, the chart. So I have that and I use that with our members. So thanks, Sue. Gary. I just want to share this with the committee members. I was at an event recently, um, and it, what someone said stuck with me. I thought it was worth sharing with everybody else. And it's a little one-off from this conversation. It's more investments related, but the dots all connect anyway. Eventually, they connect. A um, person commented that they were a 30-year investor, but they were managing their portfolio on a three-year risk basis. Um, and when we think about, and it just resonated with me, like we think about, well, over 30 years, we need to get 7%. But we have this risk mitigation strategy where we're trying to de-risk that portfolio. And because of our funding status and because we're negative cash flow on a monthly basis, that just changes a lot of my own thinking when I think about impacts that investment returns can have on the portfolio in the short run. So it's just, it's a, it's a little bit one off of this, but linking long term, but the risks are like right in front of us. More than one. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think we're back okay. to the panel. And so if I could go back to Thank you, David, for your yeah. comments. And now we'll <laughs> If I could back, go, go back to Sharon's question about what do we tell the members. So we do get calls, but I just kind of want to remind everyone that really the intent of GASB 67 and 68 is to really divorce funding from financial reporting. And so when we do get calls and say, hey, what's your funding number? I do give them David's number because really the intent of GASB 67 and 68 to, is to make um, all the pension plans consistent and comparable because they, for 67 and 68, they made sure that they, they set like an actuarial evaluation um, methodology as opposed to like for the funding plan is what's best for the plan. Just kind of want to let you guys know that. When we do get questions, we do provide David's numbers. Um, so on my presentation, I just kind of want to talk about what CalSTRS management's roles and responsibilities are when it comes to um, preparation of the financial statements. Um, so just to be clear, the financial statements are our responsibility. It's not the auditor's responsibility. We are responsible for adopting a sound um, accounting policies. We're also responsible for implementing and maintaining um, internal controls that covers um, from initiation of the transaction to recording of the transactions, um, all transactions, all events, and all conditions. Um, that it should be consistent with our management's assertions that's, all, that's embedded in our financial statements. And the fair presentation of our financial statements in conformity with generally accepted accounting principle is an integral um, part of our management's responsibility. So this slide right here shows a summary. I would say this is not a complete set of our internal controls because we do have a lot of internal controls, but this just kind of gives you um, some of the internal controls that we have existent in our financial reporting process. And as you can see, this does not just reside with the financial services branch. The internal controls goes all the way from our floor up to the executive branch, including our external um, actuary. Um, so we have a very robust, close process where it involves not just our account, our, our branch, but it does encompass like um, the investments branch, um, the communications branch, including our external actuary. And so we, we also do multiple levels of review of our trial balances and our financial statements, which eventually goes to both um, David's group and um, Milliman, who uses those financial statements and numbers to um, calculate our net pension liability for the year. And then when we get their uh, actuarial numbers back, what we do is we, we look at the numbers and we make sure we do a reasonableness check to make sure that those numbers and the assumptions that were used are consistent with what the board has adopted um, like in May. We just want to make sure that there's consistency and that the numbers are showing that you know, it's consistent with um, how we view the organization as a whole. Um, so the, through an automated process, the numbers do get fed into our financial statements, which I will show you in, in the next few slides. Um, the, the, once the, the um, schedules are all completed, it goes through our, our regular financial statement review process, which also involves multiple layers of review. 
Um, we, we have a review within the branch and we do reach out to other branch to help us review. We, um, communications do help us in terms of like the formatting and making sure that we're consistent with the CalSTRS policy. Um, we work very closely with um, investments in actuarial services when it comes to like making sure that we have all the numbers complete and accurate in our financial statements. So the next few slides, well, I'm just gonna pause for any questions if you guys have any. Okay, so I, I don't plan on going in too deep into some of this schedule, but really to just show you um, where the numbers go when we get the information from Milliman. So it does impact um, our balance sheet, an income statement, the note disclosures. It does impact um, some of the, um, um, we call this a, the required supplementary information. Um, these are all required schedules by GASB. And so look at how beautiful these are. This is our life. <laughs> this is the triple A life. And so, yeah, and I'm going to turn it over to Crow. Any questions before we get started? Let's see. Yeah. Oh, Bob does. Kevin, I know you're going to do this anyway, but um, so the GASB came up with a set of rules. They have to be followed. Um, yeah. I, and I, you'll probably do it anyway, but can you provide the board some perspective very briefly? Why? What's the GASB's objective? So the GASB could have said, hey, just whatever you're doing for funding, put it in the financial statements. They could have, but they didn't. So what's their motivation for, for the choices they made? And, and why are these things different? Why, why did they make that conscious choice? Okay. I can make my best effort is to try and get inside the Gatsby's head and could be <laughs> right or wrong with that. But if you think back to one of the previous slides, it talked about Gatsby 27 and 28, and we talk about 67 and 68. And in each case, we talk about two different Gatsby's. And I think it's important to point out because one of them relates to the plan, the other one relates to the employers. And you really have to kind of think about what they were trying to accomplish with both to understand either one. But the best example that I can give for 25 and 27, um, to, to take it into kind of generic terms, if you purchase a home, $100,000, and you have a, a mortgage, and each month you're required to make a payment of $1,200, as long as you make that $1,200 within the employer's financial statements, they never recognized a liability. So even though they had a home out there for $100,000, as long as I'm making my payments on time, I recognize no liability. And the GASB took a step back and said, that's not right. We do still owe, after a year, we still owe, you know, or two or three years, we still owe $97,000. We incurred this liability, and it should be reflected upon our financial statements. So that's really why they divorced from funding to reporting, was the idea that the employer should be recognizing a liability on the face of their financial statements. And the underlying reason for that was not to necessarily just you know, establish you know, negative fund balance or negative net assets for the employers, but this fundamental belief that in any given year, your teachers or your members, when they perform those services at that school district, that a part of their compensation expense was the contributions that the employer and the state is making. It's part of their wages. So that needed to be recognized in any given year. And to the extent that the liability increased so much more than funding, that needed to be recognized in the current year. So when you adopted 67, yeah, it has an impact upon how your members look at yourself from a funding status and how as a board you're thinking of funding status. But I would agree back to David, you've got to think of it from a long-term perspective. This was truly about trying to capture what is the right compensation expense to be recognized at the employer level or at the state level as well as recognizing that liability. Bob, does that answer your question? So a couple things, and we found that the easiest way to, to, um, to walk through our presentation was just talk about what you guys have engaged us to do and how this topic impacts each one of those. So we'll talk about our independent auditor's report. Uh, when we come back and report to you the required communications, as well as kind of those two other elements that when we have material weaknesses or significant deficiencies, 
and just efficiencies that we would include in a management letter because this topic can impact each one. So one of the things that you would first find within the independent auditor's report is that we state that the financial statements are prepared in accordance with GAAP, which David has done a good job of explaining the GASB. I would, I'd make one small nuance and to somewhat kind of defend the GASB here. Mm -hmm. um, when David talks about funding is based upon actuarial science and GASB is based upon what the GASB told us to do, what the GASB really did, it's still grounded in the actuarial sciences, and in fact, it requires it. But what it did was take seven or eight different acceptable methods, and they said you must follow one. That way, plans across the country can be compared with each other. So it's not as if we divorced ourselves from the actuarial sciences. We just picked one, put a stake in the ground, and said you must follow that one. The other kind of nuance within the GASB is they focus on plans versus programs. That's why we look at the state teacher's retirement plan or the STRIP versus the DB, the DBS, et cetera. So those are accumulated. Would not disagree from a management perspective or from a board perspective, you need to think program. But GAP is gonna define what a plan is. Management is assessed based upon how it's structured within the legislation and they've deemed the STRIP to be the plan. So when you go to the financial statements, you only see one column, and that's the state teacher's retirement plan. It doesn't differentiate between the DB, the DBS, et cetera. The other thing that I would point out is our first bullet here that we say we opine upon the CalSTRS financial statements as a whole. We're also thinking about the other programs that you have in place in addition to the STRIP. To be honest with you, it makes up 98% of the total. The STRIP <laughs> is our focus. But in reality, we are focused upon teacher's retirement system with our audit opinion, not an individual program. We also evaluate the presentation of supplementary information. We make sure that that's fairly stated in relation to the financial statements, and we perform specified procedures over the RSI. We'll walk through what each one of those means as well. But it's, in essence, there's certain information that we don't opine upon, but if it ties back to the financial statements, we make sure that it's coming from the same underlying records, the same assumptions were utilized, et cetera. What we've tried to do here is just go through the financial statements, starting with the management's discussion and analysis, all, to, all the way through the actuarial section. Many of these you saw on the previous slides that Lucy went through, but really tried to pinpoint for you where, it, where the actuarial information is obtained and then whether we, or not we believed it was presented in accordance with GASB 67 or based upon funding and also really trying to take it back to whether or not it was audited, i.e. we actually opined upon it or if it was just subject to other auditing procedures. One of the things, the, the key points that I'd like to make as far as the MDNA or the GASB 67 schedules, they all tie back to that TPL that David referred to and the NPL, which is a significant piece of your notes to the financial statement. So when we say we have opined upon that second row of the statement of fiduciary net position, the statement of changes and the related notes, we have spent significant time and effort in understanding the TPL, the estimate that went into that, as well as the offset of the fiduciary net position. Just a quick reminder of what our audit opinion covers, and in, in, in each section, um, or in, in each opinion, we talk about what our auditor's responsibility is. Um, and a key, key couple points to make. So we're looking for reasonable assurance we don't provide, you know, although management may sometimes feel like we're here every day, we're not. <laughs> and we don't have the same number of people on staff as they do sitting over their shoulder and looking at every transaction. But we try to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are, are free from material misstatement. Not free from any misstatement, but free from material misstatement. We look at amounts and disclosures that have risk of material misstatements. And in each of those two cases, we kind of think of it from two different lenses. What are the accounting policies and what are the reasonableness of the significant accounting estimates? I think David did a great job in the earlier part of the presentation just walking through how much of that TPL is truly based upon an accounting estimate. So we spend a significant amount of our time within two critical estimates of our audit perspective. The fair value of investments, what is the TPL? 
because these are not just cash in, cash out that's easily tested. So we spend a significant amount of time in the accounting estimates and we walk you through in the report charge or the, the required communications through our efforts on that. We also think that this is so critical to a user of the financial statements that we include an emphasis of matter. I'm going to skip to the very last sentence. We don't absolve ourselves of responsibility. We say our opinion is not modified with respect to this matter. But what we've done is we've alerted the readers of the financial statements that there is something so critical within the financial statements to their understanding of the fiduciary net position and the overall health of the system that they really need to look at note three. And note three are the elements that was in Lucy's, con or Lucy's presentation. We talk about the significance to the financial statements as well as just how sensitive it is to the underlying actuarial assumptions. Go back to that previous slide. So you're making the point that these actuarial assumptions are really critical. And the actuarial assumptions we heard at the very beginning, those are actually assumptions that the board makes, right? We, we adopt actuarial assumptions. So how, what, what kind of review do you do as to the reasonableness of those assumptions, or do you do, you do any review of the reasonableness of those assumptions? Uh, Brenda, feel free to jump in anywhere where you want to add to, but we do a significant amount of review of those assumptions. Uh, what we're, and we're truly trying to deem as to whether or not anything is unreasonable. Uh, <clears throat> We have, a, we have another slide where we talk about all of the various steps, whether it be probing inquiries, risk assessments, internal control assessments. I won't go over each one of these uh, at this point, but we spend a significant amount of time trying to understand are the, are the assumptions adopted by the board the best estimate as of June 30th in any given year? I'll give you an example of another state plan across the country. Uh, within their minutes, they said, we're going to adopt this funding rate or this long-term investment rate of return, although we don't believe it's the right one. We're going to phase to it over the next five years. But they tried to stick with it because what they were doing was, uh, going back to Ms. Hendricks' comment, they were trying to, they thought over the course of 30 years, it was the right assumptions to make. It didn't put an undue burden upon their employers. From a funding perspective, it was the right answer. But from a financial reporting, put a stake in the ground as of today, it's hard to justify the 8% rate of return when the board is saying, yeah, but in two or three years, we probably need to be closer to 7 Because at that point in time, the board has said, we believe 7% is our long-term rate of return. So we look at a lot of information, whether it comes from your specialist that is advising you, the discussion within the board minutes, what we're seeing at other plans, Truly, and, and what we see at other plans is provides limited evidence because it's truly based upon your experience. What are you invested in? What, is, what do you believe you will get going forward? That's the other thing that makes this really difficult on auditors as well as management is that, is that what we've done in the past or what you've done in the past isn't really you know, a guarantee of what we will do in the future. So although the last five or 10 years you've had X in rate of return, we're really trying to project what we believe your rate of long-term rate of return is on a go-forward basis. So a significant amount. So, and as I recall, when we made a decision to go from seven and a half to seven over a two-year period of time, we had a, we had a, an actuarial report, which assumed seven and a quarter, and then the next one seven. But on the financial statement side, we jumped straight to seven, right? We jumped straight to seven, and management understood right from the get-go that that's what they had to do from a management's best estimate. Your team did, understood both the funding as well as GAP perfectly. Thank you. I'll take you back on. Okay. Another part of our opinion, and I just, I'd focus on a couple of the last sentences. So the last sentence, we say we do not express an opinion or provide any assurance because of the limited procedures. The sentence before we talk about what those limited procedures are, it's still subject to our audit test work. 
but the information within management's discussion and analysis, as well as some of those pension <coughs> or supplementary schedules that Lucy referred to, those aren't part of the basic financial statement, so our opinion doesn't stick to them. But we still spend a significant amount of time making sure that that information is consistent with the amounts reported within the basic financial statements, um, as well as prepared um, based upon the same estimates and the same underlying records. So although we don't provide um, an opinion, it's not as if we ignore it and say we don't even have to read those sections. There's still a significant amount of work performed there. So, Paul, we, we, we skipped forward to this um, to try to answer your question earlier, but this is kind of a high-level look at our audit approach. And if you reflect back to our report charge to governance after the last audit period, when we talk about the things that we do as it relates to this estimate, significant amount of time of our audit effort is, is encompassed here. Starts with probing inquiries, with management, with the armed committee members, as well as minutes. Uh, and we really have to think from a risk assessment, both from an error, where the, is the underlying data correct? Were there, were there mistakes made in the, in the actuarial science of rolling forward that information? As well as a risk of fraud. Um, and we have viewed uh, our, during the course of the last five to 10 years, you know, auditors have always liked to pick a, one side or the other for whether or not we believe fraud could occur. With the adoption of 67 and 68, I would argue that a, a lot of plans had a vested interest in increasing their funding status. They had a vested interest in decreasing their funding status to arrive at more contributions. So when we think fraud, we really think both sides of the house and try to make sure that somehow, whether it be the board or management, doesn't have a vested interest in coming up with a different estimate than versus the best estimate. Lucy talked about all of the internal controls that she has in place over both determining the actuarial number as well as the fin ultimate financial reporting. We look, at, we look at and test each of those internal controls. It is an estimate primarily based upon management specialist. Um, Lucy doesn't have the capability, nor does Kevin have the capability to generate that TPL. It takes somebody that is grounded within the actuarial sciences and has the proper uh, experience and education to perform that. So we, we really look at and evaluate three different sets of specialists. We look at Milliman, we look at your internal actuaries, and then we make sure that the external or the, the auditor specialists, we happen to, to um, subcontract that to GRS, but making sure that our, that our subcontractors have the ability to, to evaluate those assumptions and come back to us. We not only look at the current actuarial studies, we, we, look, in, we look at and test the, the most recent experience studies. We look at information that comes out of audit services, whether it be related to the internal controls over financial reporting or the demographic data coming through the census test work. So not only the, the test work that we do, we will look to make sure that Larry's group has an identified risk or concerns that we need to pull into our, into our um, test work as well. There's really two sets of information that we think of from a TPL stat, from a TPL perspective. What's the underlying information? What's the data that's fed to the actuaries? And then ultimately the estimate or the, the assumptions that are used to craft that roll forward of current data. We spend a significant amount of time through the employer's audits, testing the information that is submitted to you by the employers as it relates to de demographic data. We also need to look at your inactives and retirees where Cal Sturz is the owner of the information versus the individual um, LEAs. We use a variety of computer-assisted audit techniques in order to gain coverage over 800,000 plus members. We're not looking at 800,000. We rely very heavily upon some key data elements and some very powerful computer structures to make sure that outliers, variances per from previous years are identified and that we understand what those are. We've identified the attributes listed above as those that could have a significant impact upon the ultimate TPL. So we test that, that, that the information is supported uh, for each one of those um, key attributes. Then, as specified within our audit opinion, these are the, the key assumptions within the, the strip TPL. 
we look at the investment rate of return. As David said, each year we look at that crossover date to make sure that that hasn't been achieved because that is the one thing that could have the most significant impact. I take you back a couple slides to one of Lucy's where it actually shows what a 1% plus, a 1% minus, or a 2% could have on the ultimate liability. So when you think about whether or not you achieve a crossover, and, and, and Chairman Rosenstiel, I think you said current AA was in the 4%. You can see what a 1% decrease would take you from a 92 million or 92 billion NPL to 135. So that has a significant impact upon how you view your overall liability and, and your funding status. <coughs> a couple other key things that, that I really want to point out here on this slide is probably the third bullet, the evaluate and test reasonableness of key assumptions. And, and again, Chairman, this goes to your question. We have to make sure that as of any point in time, back to, back to Dr. Yetman's um, focus on a snapshot, how are we doing it at a single point in time, we have to make sure that what you have said is your best estimate as of that point in time. Not where we think we'll be in a year from now, not because, hey, it worked last year. What is the best estimate of this TPL as of June 30th? Um, again, uh, Ms. Hendricks, I think it's, a, it's an ability to judge where you are on that ultimate path, and that ultimate path that David alluded to is the most critical, but this is kind of that snapshot of a check as to where am I at on June 30th, 2018. We've listed out the schedules there that we also, um, that are included within the RSI, and, and were referenced in Lucy's report. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So um, one of the reasons we look at our finance, our, at all of our statements is we're trying to understand our own situation, but there is a lot of discussion about, well, what does CalSTRS look like relative to other plans? Um, when we're thinking about trying to, to, to compare ourselves, uh, evaluate ourselves relative to other plans, what, what are the advantages or the disadvantages of either using financial statements to do the comparison or actuarial studies to do the comparison? Which is probably a better way of, to do a comparison? If we all want to go. <laughs> Let's start from the right. <laughs> so the, the comparing, that was one of Gatsby's goals, to make financial statements comparable, not only across time, if they ever stop changing the standards, but more importantly, across systems. So to the extent that they did put a stake in the sand and say, hey, this of the seven, six reasonable assumptions you could choose, use this one. To the extent that everyone's using that one, then the financial statements, I believe, are more useful for comparing across systems, comparing Minnesota to Oregon to California. I, I think of the funding as more like a managerial accounting or an internal accounting process that's more useful to you because it's based on your specific experience, your own decisions, your own culture, and you get to make the call of what you use. And, so, and then it's smooth to take away some of the exaggerations that can happen from year to year. So it's really more useful for decisions internally. The funding, as you've heard, we've, everyone here said that many times. But if you really want to do a comparison across units, I believe that's where financial statements shine through. Because the auditor is holding a very specific set of standards across the, the units. That's my opinion. I think the one caveat I'll put, I think sometimes what complicates at is you, you have to understand what each system provides. Like for us, we have four separate programs. A reader of our financial system, if they're not aware of this, they may think that we're better funded than a system that's 60% funded across the, the country, but they only offer a defined benefit program. So, so you know, I agree, it's, it's very hard to compare, but it's almost, you have to dig in a little bit deeper than just looking at the overall number to understand what's included in that, in, in, in that number. You both took two of the things I would say. The only other element I would add is in a stable environment, 
I think that the financial statements, as, as Dr. Yetman referred to, is much more comparable. But again, if you had a dramatic, a dramatic event within the financial markets between June 30th and your peer that has a 930th or a 1231 year end, either positive or negative to that fair value, there is no smoothing of assets. You could have a dramatic impact upon your funding in one day. So it's very difficult to say if you know an event to, such as that has occurred that you're still comparable. Okay. Oh, Lynn. Thank you. Um, you, um, spark my curiosity, Kevin. So GASB does not require everybody to report as of June thirtieth. No. So the, the GAP has no requirements as of what your fiscal year end. That is typically within state legislation, um, and varies by across the fifty states. You'll see um, June thirtieth, eight thirty ones, nine thirties, twelve thirty ones, three thirty ones. Um, one that, you know, that was one of, the, this is somewhat side, side note, but one of, um, one of the early GASB items when they were contemplating 67 and 68 was a concept that the employers had to report the NPL exactly as of their year end. Uh, and one of your peers kind of raised their hand and said, you do recognize that of our 800 employers, we have 12 different fiscal year ends. We can't generate what our fiduciary net position is 12 different times. So they gave us some relief and said, make it as the NPL as of the plans date, but there's no requirement within GAP that says what a fiscal year end is. Is there, has there been any discussion to change that? Because if they're truly trying to make it apples to apples comparison, I think that's a good point that if you have different dates, um, there's not because, uh, you know, I think the Gatsby catches a lot of grief already for trying to, quote, unquote, put their, you know, put their stamp on how people manage themselves. Uh, and in some cases, it could put you in direct violation of, of what your state law is. So if you have to have audited financial statements as of June 30th, and they said, but it has to be as of December 31st, uh, it would just be one more element that people would complain about the Gatsby. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? <clears throat> well, this is really excellent. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, everybody, for uh, like really team. clear. <laughs> yeah, the AAA Dream Team, clarifying a lot. And it, it's it's interesting that um, <clears throat> we say that our financial statements are on the website and our actuarial reports are on our website. Maybe maybe this could be on the website as well, so that it can connect them and people who have these questions about I don't understand it can be. You know, it's not that you don't want to answer questions. We staff would still, I'm sure, be happy to answer questions, but it might it might help uh, uh, explain things. So, excellent work. Thank you very much. So, um, we're now at the in review of uh, information requests. Did we have any? Uh, we had one, Mr. Seha, uh, requested a report illustrating the time it takes, it is taken to resolve audit findings um, over the, the course of employer audits. Okay, great. Uh, that was the only one, though, I think. Okay. okay. And uh, we have a draft agenda for the next meeting. Any, uh, any comments on that? Okay. Um, and uh, opportunity for statements from the public. Don't see anyone, so we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. We'll, Harry, what time 10, do we? 10, 10 o'clock. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.